Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm super excited to see all of you for uh, this panel about the past, present, and future of Airflow. Um, you will hear from the panel about how the project has changed over the years, the community around it, and where they see it headed. And my name is Marc Lamarty. I will be the moderator for that uh, panel, for that amazing panel. I'm very excited to be here um, and honored. Um, and um, I will let the panel members introduce themselves, um, starting with maybe you, Ryak. Yarek. OK, uh, Jarek Potiuk, uh, maintainer, PMC member, Apache Software Foundation member, uh, and individual software, individual contributor. I'm the lucky person that can uh, contribute to open source uh, full time and be paid for that for by various uh, stakeholders in Airflow, which I'm very thankful for, uh, like to Astronomer, Google, Amazon, uh, and uh, well, simple and few other companies that are sponsoring me as a, as a maintainer, as a contributor. Kexil. Hey, Kaksil Naik here. I'm a PMC member and committer of the Airflow Project Simulator, Jarek, and the director of engineering at Astronomer. And it has been a great ride so far. I'm just excited to see all of you today. Our first in-person summit. It's been five, six years probably more uh, that I've been involved with this project. So I'm really, really excited today. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Pierre John Brun. Uh, I am also a committer and PMC member on Apache Airflow. Um, I've been contributing for a bit less than two years now. And um, I am not lucky enough to work full time on Apache Airflow. Uh, my day to day job is a full stack uh, developer working freelance and I'm based in uh, Paris, France. Awesome. So thank you so much for your introductions. And um, before moving forward, someone else wanted to be here, but unfortunately, for uh, personal reasons, um, he hasn't been able to join us. However, uh, he left us a message in video that should be able to see. Here we go. Hi, I'm Ash Berlin Taylor, a PMC member and a longtime contributor to Apache Airflow. Um, I'm sad to say I won't be able to make it to uh, the first in-person Apache Airflow conference. Um, family health reasons means I'm not able to travel. Um, so I'll have to meet you all in person at a, at a meetup or at the next uh, in-person conference. I'm uh, looking forward to it. So Apache Airflow has kind of been coming on in leaps and bounds in the last eight years since, uh, since it was first created and open sourced. Um, I think one of, the, one of our big strengths is the, is the people, kind of the Airflow community is what keeps the project going and keeps it strong. Um, so on that, I'm super excited to announce some new committers. So we've got Pankaj Koti and Amo Desai, um, who are both um, new committers. So congratulations, both of you. Um, and to kick things off, I'd just like to ask the panel a question. Um, what, are the most what are you the most excited to see added to Airflow in the next year? Thank you, Ash. Um, we are looking forward to uh, seeing you very soon. Um, congratulations again to the new commissioners. Uh, really, congratulations. I think we can make a big <laughs> clap for them. And, and both Amok and uh, uh, Pankaj sorry, are here uh, as, uh, as attendees. Congratulations. Uh, before answering uh, Ash's question, I think um, I would like to start from the very beginning of your airflow journey, actually. And uh, I think it would be nice to hear more about how did you start with airflow? Maybe how big was the community at that time? Um, was it easy for you to uh, onboard on this project? Uh, can you tell us more about that, maybe starting with you, Yarek? Uh, OK, I started like four and a half years ago, maybe five. Uh, committer number, like there were like 15 committers by that time, maybe active, maybe 5, 10. We have 57, 59 uh, with Pankaj and, and Amok today. Uh, was it easy? Uh, I would say uh, I'm, people might know me from creating Breeze and uh, development environment for, uh, for Apache Airflow. And the main reason why I created it was because it took me about a week to set up a development environment when I first started with Airflow. So it wasn't easy. 
it, it, was, it, was, it was quite a challenge to get into uh, even first commit. So the, the goal for me was when I did it to, to improve it and after four years it works. It took a little bit of time. Uh, and uh, I started uh, contributing. Uh, so th th the story for me is like first time when I used uh, Airflow, um, I evaluated it for a, a company that I worked uh, at at this moment. It was a robotic uh, AI company. I was a robotics engineer uh, in the company. And uh, we evaluated Airflow for our machine lear learning workflows and we re rejected it. So that's, that was my first encounter with Airflow, but I saw the potential of it. And uh, when Google hired my company to contribute to Airflow, because they started Composer and they wanted to contribute to Airflow, and the easiest way was to hire a company uh, that could start contributing things that were important for Google. Uh, they hired my company that I co-owned by that time, and I realized the potential of Airflow five years ago, and I quit the fantastic robotics and engineer job. And I was actually you know, moving the robot hands and developing drivers for it, so it was really like exciting thing. But I said, okay, open source Airflow is far more exciting, so I quit the job <laughs> in, in the robotics company and joined back the, my company to contribute to Airflow. That was my beginning. That's a very good story. What about you, Kixi? Like, did you feel it was hard at the beginning? Um, I started using Airflow around 2016. Like, we were, I was working at the consultancy and uh, we were looking for an orchestrator. They wanted to migrate everything from their on-prem to Google Cloud. Um, and we knew Google was uh, launching Cloud Composer, so it just became uh, a bit easier. However, there were not many integrations. Like one of the strengths of Airflow as a project is its integrations. Uh, and we had good Google Cloud con uh, integrations, but some were still missing. So uh, we, uh, me and a few folks uh, created more operators and we thought, let's, let's just try and contribute this back to the project and see if they accept it. Um, I created my first PR fixing a typo. Uh, and thanks to Balke, he rejected my PR. Um, <laughs> so he was like, add unit test. And I was like, unit test, really, I can't. <laughs> but he, he helped me uh, go through that PR and that was my first encounter with an open source project ever. Uh, and once I fixed it, like Rich was mentioning, one of the good things about open source and contributing to an open source project is the recognition. Like there were people uh, thanking me just for fixing a typo. Just like, hey, we, we were going to use this and it works because of this PR. Like, cool, looks like I should do this more. Um, and from 2017 onwards, I just started contributing even more. And that, that's, that's the story. I, 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 can't, I cannot go back now. I, I really, really love Airflow and I'm very passionate about it since then. Awesome. Yeah. Um, for me, the experience, I think, was a bit different. Um, after a few years in the software industry, I felt like I needed to contribute back. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we used plenty of uh, free software. Uh, those are building components uh, for everything that we do. And I was like, okay, if I have to contribute back, back. it's time for me. Uh, if no one does this, the project would just die. So um, I started looking around to find a project I would be able to contribute to. Uh, I didn't know Airflow at the time, uh, so I started looking around. Um, I, found, I found out Airflow. Uh, I started uh, digging deeper, uh, seeing that the community is great. Uh, also seeing that it's a, a, quote, a full stack project. What I mean by that is any uh, software skills you have, uh, you can help in Airflow. Uh, that could be front end, back end, uh, DevOps, security, there's uh, work for everything. Um, and this is very interesting. Uh, so I was like, okay, I think this is the project. Um, then I watched the trillion and trillion served um, documentary. Uh, which is very like a great motivation, and I was like, okay, this is a project uh, I need to start contributing. I started very small with documentation and provider change, and then uh, it got bigger and bigger, and uh, the involvement um, yeah it got more important for me. And uh, this is how I started, I suppose. I, I think that's the the beauty of of you know uh, being part of an open source project is how the stories are different, uh, really, and why we join for. Uh, you know, participating uh, in an open source project. It's, it's really amazing to see um, how we are all 
you know, having different stories at the end. And, and, and how they are intertwined, because uh, I didn't mention before, but Kaxil was, was my, like, the most important first mentor mm. in the project where I joined. So when I, when I started contributing, then I, I, I got told by someone, you know, talk to this, this guy, Kaxil, he will help you. And he did. Actually, Kexil is amazing. We know that. Yeah, and it was the same for me when I started. I uh, had a lot of interaction with Brent and uh, Ilad and then Yarek, and they pointed me to different issues, to things that would interest me, and this is how my interest grew for, for the project. Awesome. Um, so, can we talk more about like what feature are you most proud of that solved a painful issue in the past? Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are many, but if you can think of things that were painful for the community in the past and maybe what features um, have helped to solve that? Kexil? For me, I think it's two themes, right? Uh, we spent a lot of time around Airflow 2.0 uh, to improve the DAG authoring experiences. So just the task flow API, uh, task groups, um, and yeah, differable operators also fall into the same category and data sets. Like that changed uh, how we write DAGs. Uh, and Vikram is going to talk about uh, it in, in, in one of his separate talks. Um, and then the operational aspects, uh, the whole um, scheduler HA stuff and axialization that Ash and I worked on, I think um, including the performance optimization from Kamil um, were, were very important for the project at that time. Uh, and I think that is what I'm super proud of that Airflow 2.0 was one of the biggest milestones of the mm -hmm. projects. <laughs> Definitely, there is there is a world be between uh, 2.0 and, and 1.x. What about you, Pierre? Um, maybe I want to mention the work we did uh, on the interface and the UI. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've come a long way. Uh, two years ago when I started, uh, the UI was looking a bit old, maybe when we compare this to other orchestration uh, solution. And um, we started um, to use uh, modern frameworks uh, such as React. And so we started the first uh, view, I think, was the grid view, was built on uh, React. Uh, and then we started bringing more and more things into this uh, uh, new way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> and then we did the data sets, uh, cluster activity, and this uh, definitely set a new standard for the front end um, interface. Uh, this also opens up a lot of opportunities. Uh, everything is more responsive, uh, dynamic. Uh, we have auto refresh. Uh, everything is much easier to maintain as well because we follow um, standard of the industry for with tests, uh, TypeScript. Um, so we catch bugs way earlier. So I think the, the interface has come a long way. And uh, there's definitely more things to do and things that we would like to do. Uh, but I think it's important for the users to have uh, something easy to use um, yeah, and very responsive and uh, flow with it, yeah. Actually, speaking about the UI, I think you released uh, something, um, I think like last month, I believe, for 2.7. Can you tell more about that? Um, yeah, so we added a, new, a whole new page, which is the cluster activity page. Um, the goal is to allow people to monitor their uh, cluster and see if everything is uh, green. Um, what I mean by that is you can, uh, in a blink of an eye, see if some DAGs are failing, uh, some runs are taking too long, uh, if you have some uh, pools that are uh, completely filled up and don't have any space anymore to run tasks. Um, before, you had to do it uh, manually on your own. Uh, you could do that with uh, Grafana and other solutions like this. and. Uh, using the API and uh, start the events, but this was definitely some work uh, that you have to do on your own. And um, I think now having this uh, natively in the solution really helps. Uh, there's definitely room for improvement. Um, the dashboard is for now uh, quite basic, but uh, I definitely uh, encourage you to uh, participate and uh, contribute back as well if you have something that you would like to see uh, in the dashboard. Yeah, I love I love that view. Uh, truly, I think it's very helpful. What about you, uh, Yarek? Like, what what is the feature that you are the most so proud of? And the, 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 this was really funny to see uh, Rich mentioning the this 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 one guy that is contributing a lot to Airflow. The 
but the, the, the fact is that I contribute very little number of features because I, will, I mostly work on the infrastructure that underpins uh, Airflow in, in various ways, uh, like dependencies, uh, development environment, and things like that. Uh, so for me, the, the important uh, features that are not really visible for the users is the uh, making it easier to contribute. And the breeze is definitely something that is my, my child and the, the way how people can much easier develop and contribute and and have a local environment for testing the same as the CI because this is the this is the the, 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 the biggest uh, the, the most important property of Breeze. Uh, but but I did contribute a few features uh, that I'm really proud of and one of them is a really small like it took me probably a few days or maybe like including iteration and everything is external python operator mm -hmm. which was added like in 2 3 I think something like that. Uh, it was like very small, very uh, like straightforward when it, we thought about that we need to have something like that. But then it turned out that it opens up all the world of different ways of using Airflow, including, uh, and, and this shows how really small features can lead to something bigger. Like I'm talking about multi-tenancy multi uh, in, a, uh, in a few hours. Uh, but also there is a talk from World Simple about um, uh, about their way of implementing multi-tenancy, and they are my, cu my customers. We were talking regularly. The external Python was actually coming from their discussions with them that they would need that. That was like really cool, and, and I threw it together in like a few days, really. And then they are talking about how they are using the external Python operator in order to uh, implement multi-tenancy in their own way, mm -hmm. and that's super impactful, even if it was really small. Uh, and and. This is actually one thing that I didn't expect at all that's going to be so, so powerful. Yeah. yeah, some of the most um, powerful features have come come by like this, right? Like the custom XCOM backend, uh, the custom uh, secrets backend. All of those were probably small ideas. Hey, should we do th uh, things like this? Yeah, let's try it out. Next, you know, there's a PR, PR merge, and then someone starts adding Google secrets back and AWS secrets back and I know we hacked uh, on with Paula and others uh, in, in two nights with some more backends and stuff. So that's the beauty of the community, I guess. Yeah, and I think, Eric, you, you made a very good point. Um, there are very important features that are not visible. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like when you... Uh, change something on your website, you change the button or the color and everybody is happy, but uh, actually you just removed like thousands of lines of codes and nobody cares. Um, I think it's very, it's, it's actually very true. Um, is there any, um, like, are there any beneficial features that you feel the community doesn't know about? Because Airflow has evolved so much in the past 10 years, and I'm sure that there are some features that people don't even know about. Um, is there, are you thinking of any, do you think of any features maybe? Maybe a small thing about the task notes uh, mm. and uh, DAG, uh, DAG run notes. Uh, I don't think they ha that there was a lot of communication about this, but I think it's nice. So you can uh, annotate uh, task instances and uh, runs. For instance, if you have to clear um, a run and you just want to communicate with your colleagues why you did that or you, you saw something, you just can leave a note. And uh, later on, we added the feature to support markdown syntax, uh, so this is a small thing, but uh, if you want to do some very fancy uh, notes with images, links, uh, titles, and, stu and stuff, um, you, can do, you can do this. And you can also do this directly through the API as well. Uh, if this is like uh, you trigger the run from the Python client, and then you want to add a note on, the, on this specific that run, you can do this as well, yeah. What about you, uh, Kixil? I think dynamic task mapping, it's known, but it's not that well known. That plus data sets as well. I think uh, those are very powerful one. I think we just probably need to do, have more visibility and write more blog posts around it because uh, they are very, very powerful features. Dynamic task mapping, uh, the problem we have solved over there is I think we can apply generally uh, running task in parallel to an unknown number of files and stuff. Um, and data sets, we still need to evolve. Um, and I know there would be talks around it as well. Uh, so I think those two in my mind are one of the lesser known features, but have a uh, very high impact. I, again, uh, a little bit of shameful promotion of my talk. Uh, <laughs> another one. Uh, 
I think the feature, it's not a feature, uh, like as you would normally name it, but I think many people still think that we are in, in Airflow 1.10 uh, realm, that Airflow is a monolithic single uh, application that you install, uh, which is largely true because of backwards compatibility. You can do that and you can install Airflow plus all the integrations like providers together with it as a single uh, version. But since the 2.0, and by the way, if you are not on, if you are still on 1.10, uh, don't I mean, move to Airflow to as far uh, actually, as, I, as I, soon I think, as possible. I think it's a great question. Like yeah. maybe if we can, if you can raise your hand, those who are on Airflow 1.10, yeah. maybe. Who, who, who is still using Airflow 1.10? And don't, don't be afraid. Don't, <laughs> don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> don't be shy. It's okay. Don't be shy. There's a separate so, room for those people. I don't know <laughs> <that's> <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So, uh, the, uh, so, so for me, the, the the fact that you can separately install and downgrade and downgrade and upgrade providers pretty freely, independently from Airflow, is like very powerful features that not uh, a lot of people still use uh, or already use, uh, because that that gives you the opportunity of upgrading Airflow, but without the hassle of upgrading all your DAGs that are using older version of providers and backward compatibility issues. And that's something that I would like people to be more aware that this is a, a path that they can take uh, and treat the providers separately from Airflow, which is not common. Mm. You know, I, I don't know what you think about that, but um, I feel actually as a data engineer, it's, it's getting harder and harder to keep up with all of those new features and, you know, all the tools that we need to interact with. Um, so um, I think it's, um, I'm actually very happy that we have having this uh, Airflow Summit because there are a bunch of talks that are covering those features that maybe some people, have, some of you don't know, and they are very, very useful. So. Um, I'm just glad that, that we are all here together. Yeah, one of the things I want to highlight is like Daniel Imberman put it very nicely in one of the docs. He said, uh, uh, healthy airflow is a boring airflow, um, which is, it works perfectly fine, so why bother about changing things? So yeah, we, we go to a, gr a great lens to make sure that uh, we have a healthy balance of uh, innovation, but a reliability at the same time. Like, Airflow is one of the projects where we fight a lot to say, hey, don't make this backwards incompatible change. Uh, put, th put this behind a config flag and whatnot. That's why Airflow probably has 140 plus configurations. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we go with uh, to a greater lens to make sure users can upgrade Airflow reliably. Uh, Airflow downgrade is one another uh, feature that is uh, less hidden. That is because hopefully you should never need it. <laughs> but if you need it, there is a way for you to utilize that um, and have confidence that uh, you can reliably upgrade. And Mark, you, you say it's hard to keep up with uh, everything that's uh, released. Um, but one of the goals we have for the future is maybe to release even more frequently. So we might have to figure a way to keep the user uh, up to date with uh, everything we are doing. Well, I will try to put, to post as much content as I can then to cover all of that. <laughs> but, um, so moving from uh, the past to the present, um, can you can you tell us more about like what contributors are focusing right now, like what they are focused on right now? Maybe uh, you know what is missing in Airflow and the contributors are working on um, to to fill the gaps. I think it's a little different from each stakeholder point of view and a little different from each PMC member point of view as well. I think if you talk to Jarek, I don't want to steal his spotlight, but I'll let him talk. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, I think the data set is something that uh, was added to Airflow, but we still need to iterate on top of it, like uh, allowing um, polling external events, uh, polling external, let's say S3 uh, bucket and see if there are any changes, start your decks um, and stuff. So I think that in my mind is something we will work on pretty much uh, very soon. Yeah, like maybe. Okay. So it, it's, it's really, uh, uh, Airflow is now pretty different than it was a few years ago because we have so many different streams and people working in parallel on different things. Uh, so it's it's really hard to say what's uh, most important, but I I would like really t take this moment to you know praise every you know all the contributors who are like you can see them you can, you, you, what you see on the screen right now it's the uh, it's the two 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 thousand six hundred uh, contributors that we have right now this is like wow fantastic 
some of them are anonymous, some of them have, fa have faces. That, Those are actual faces of airflow. We are just yes, representatives. Exactly. But yeah, airflow is airflow because of all these people. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm really looking forward to all the small kind of improvements that we don't have uh, time to work on as maintainers and focus um, deeply. There are lots of small, really small improvements like improving like they have, how the external operator works, for example, like, uh, for now, like Jens was, is working, uh, I'm not sure if Jens is here, but working on caching, the, uh, there, there he is. So uh, improving the caching mechanism for, uh, uh, for, for external Python operator and virtual, or for virtual Python operator, actually. There's like small things, but very powerful and useful. And, and I would say, I don't, uh, the things that, that Kaxin mentioned, important, super important. Uh, the, uh, but I think the, uh, right now we are really entering, and, and coming back to your question about the, like keeping up with the, with the pace. I think we have right now, we are right now at the stage that we should focus on mostly improving and optimizing what we have, a little bit adding more, more features, of course, new ones, new things that are necessary, but more like looking at, Okay, data sets, like what do we miss there? How can we improve that? Mm -hmm. How to make it more useful? Uh, or, or, or virtual Python operator, how, how we can make it more useful and, and, and solve uh, particular small problems with it. So I, I, I feel that this part of Airflow, like optimizing a lot of the things that we have is the, the kind of like should be the most focused as a collective, like what, should, what contributors should be working on. And then, and this is the, the great part of that is that everyone can contribute. So like, I'm, I'm, call to action again, like if you want to contribute, this is the, uh, like all those things, making it better is the, is, is, is open for everyone. You don't have to spend a lot of time on thinking how to implement it, a lot of time on designing and, and, and going through the Airflow improvement proposal, just see the improvement opportunity, open a PR, have a discussion and get it implemented. And this is the, like collectively, if we add up all the, hundreds of people who are working on that. Uh, if we can do that, if we can, can make it happen, that will be the biggest improvement in a, as a whole for, for, the, for Airflow, I think. I agree, I definitely agree. Um, actually, I feel that there are many things um, that we can work on with Airflow for sure. Um, and maybe one, one question is how do, we, how do we set priorities then like, because for example, if I if I if I um, go to the repository of Airflow and say, hey, I would like to have that fixed, or maybe uh, can we have that feature um, added? Then what's the process um, usually? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so I really think that the priorities are driven by the community um, and the people willing to drive the change. So, for instance, if you want a bug fixed. Um, if you're lucky, someone will be interested or someone has the same issue than you and uh, will take it and uh, propose a patch for it. Um, most certain way of getting it fixed is to do it yourself. Um, now for myself, when I try to find something to work on, uh, I like to check the attention the issue is getting and the reaction it has. So for instance, don't hesitate to thumbs up or add reaction to issues. Um, when I see an issue with a lot of uh, reaction, this is something that will motivate me to work on this particular issue. Um, so yeah, I would say the community drives the change and uh, the effort uh, has to come from the community as well, not only from the maintainers. Yeah, one thing I'll add is um, the mailing list. The dev mailing list is the place to go, uh, especially if you are seeing problems and you want to start a discussion, that should be the place where you go. Uh, the entire mailing list is completely publicly viewable. Uh, so for search, if there, if there are things that has been already discussed, and if you are suffering from the same issue, just hey, say, I'm suffering from the same issue. Maybe we should, uh, maybe you have a proposal already on how you want to work for it. If you have good, create an airflow improvement proposal. Um, and that's how you can then drive a change. Uh, there will be chances that if you are facing an issue, there would be others like you who would be facing the same. So mailing list uh, is the place you go and then GitHub issues as well. Okay, thank you. All right, now it's time for the spicy questions. <laughs> 
I think there are a few questions that um, the community is wondering for sure. Um, and I don't think they are easy answers, but still it's, it's great to talk about those questions, those spicy questions. Um, I think the first one is, and it's definitely a long debate, but um, can we do data processing in Airflow? Should we or should we not? Like, what are your thoughts about that? And maybe, Yarek, if you want to start. We often <laughs> fall into the trap of telling our users what uh, they should and shouldn't do. They do it. They do process, they, <laughs> they do use <laughs> and process data in Airflow. And apparently it's a valid use case uh, for, for many of them. Uh, this is this is the impression I have from seeing the questions and, and, and people asking uh, if they are doing it right and, and things like that. So uh, it's possible you can do it if you have a valid case. Yes, why not? Uh, especially, I think one of the things that we should work on, and that's that's also uh, a little bit of what how we can make Airflow better is to improve the case where, where Airflow is like a smaller instance, not necessarily uh, like fully distributed, handling the workflows which are kind of self-contained mm -hmm. without reaching out too much outside. Uh, and we should make Airflow a little bit, uh, handling this a little bit better. And in this case, handling data processing inside Airflow for like smaller, smallish cases is, is, is quite, quite okay. I mean, that, that's how it should be, I think. Because then you will avoid all the complexity of the of setting up all the external things and, and, and making it distributed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why not? Yeah, and uh, especially with uh, dynamic task mapping, I think it opens up a lot of opportunities, and people often use that to do some data processing in Airflow. Um, yeah, maybe for some uh, small use cases, it's uh, doable, and if it works for you, then uh, go for it. But um, I think on a large scale, uh, there are other tools that are specific for that. Airflow is not designed for this. And uh, there is plenty of other tools very powerful to do this. Uh, and I, rec I would recommend uh, use those instead of uh, Airflow for this particular task. So I think that's the beauty of it. We disagree in the <laughs> panel itself. Because uh, I think there's no reason not to use it for data processing. Uh, with uh, Kubernetes Executor, you can do whatever you like. Uh, if you have larger machines, uh, you can run anything using the Taskflow API. Uh, and the, the industry is circling back, using Spark and everything, and then now uh, coming back, back to in-memory uh, stores, using Dask, using a uh, lot of SQLite and, and stuff. So I think there's a world where we can now say Airflow can do our data processing well. Uh, and with custom XCOM backend, I don't, I don't see why not. OK. Um, I guess like, and I think it's a question for you, Kexil. Um, and maybe one of the biggest questions. <laughs> can you tell us more about DAG versioning? Um, because I, I think some people are wondering where we are at. It's a complex topic for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so DAG versioning has been coming up in the Airflow Summit uh, survey since last three years. Uh, we had one attempt to, to, towards it in uh, two years back. Uh, so how we wanted to roll it out was at least uh, touch the UI part of it. Because right now, if you deploy your DAGs, if your task is removed and stuff, uh, you'll still see the latest version of the DAG, even for the previous run. So we wanted to handle that first and then touch the workers uh, afterwards. But um, the community wanted the entire one. We had a vote within the, on, on the mailing list, and the vote did not succeed. Uh, everyone wanted, uh, or not everyone, but most of them wanted uh, DAG version end to end, which is the UI and the worker. So the version of the DAG gets logged when the DAG run is created and the worker will fail if it does not. Uh, but we wanted to take an iterative approach because otherwise it becomes a long project and I don't want uh, us to wait until a year before we roll it out. So that was the story behind our last attempt. Uh, we, ha we Right now, at least from my perspective, we are focusing on data sets. And once we are done with that story, probably uh, bringing that back because I would like to get DAG versioning and DAG fetcher uh, inside Airflow as soon as possible, uh, but at least complete the data set feature first um, and, and then move towards it. 
it's great. And there, there are still um, other ways of, of doing DAG versioning. I mean, even if it's not maybe the best way, it's still, uh, there are still other ways of, of doing DAG versioning. Um, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, this is the, 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 the title of, of, uh, of the talk uh, of Bolke, I believe, um, which is um, Operators Need to Die. So, do they need to die? Very catchy. Yeah, very, very catchy. catchy. I think uh, it's, so. It's that's Bol the question. Like, Bolke is, is, is Bolke I don't. Here. I don't know if Bolke is some, here. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you think about that? Like, do they need? Do they need to die? <laughs> I think it's a clickbait title. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I remember that. Uh, I mean, I think we we are all aware of this um, article, which was about you know you should not use. All the operators, I believe, just but just one. I think it was the Kubernetes pod operator. It's a very uh, old article, actually. Um, I mean, I don't want to come back at that, but do you think that you can do most of your work with just a few operators, or is okay, it? So, uh, yeah, let me take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the the article about Kubernetes pod operator and uh, you are using Airflow wrong. That was the mm, title sorry. of the article. I remember reading it. Uh, it was so wrong title. <laughs> so I think you no. Know, I kind of after some time I fell in love in the task flow operator. In 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 a sense, I uh, realized how powerful it is. Uh, I even wrote an article uh, on like how you can make transfer operate tra transfer operators made made easy, where you use task flow operator and hooks. To perform transfers because this is this seems like much more natural than using operators which are dedicated to do transfers. So at that time I thought, yeah, actually everyone should use uh, task flow operators and uh, and uh, and hooks rather than operators. And even I started discussion. Okay, should we remove all the operators we have? And I think I discussed it with Ash and Caxil. Uh, we had some. Some argument there, as you as you, like, we have lots of we, we have lots of arguments in the community. In case you didn't know, like, if you if you see two committers arguing, that's normal. That's like that's how that happens all the times. So we often disagree, but very nicely, uh, usually. Uh, <laughs> so we had this discussion, and uh, and I saw. Um, I think I took a lot of. You know information from uh, from the users reporting how they are using Airflow. Many of our users are actually praising the uh, the easiness of use of operators. They are just putting the, the several blocks together and they just work. They don't have to worry about writing Python code. Many of our users don't like to write Python. Well, like yeah, it's strange, but yes, they they just want to throw things together, make dependencies, and and let it work. So taking away this uh, feature from Airflow would take away a lot of our users. So I think while it's not uh, the only case where you use Airflow, it, it shouldn't be like, you know, they should disappear. And I, I don't think, by the way, the bulk is talk is about this. It's just the, the click by the title. <laughs> so so I think I think operators is a, one of the biggest, the number of operators we have, a number of ready-to-use cases. Because operator is basically a, a ready-to-use use case that you want to use in your workflow. That's that's what it is. Uh, with some limitations, uh, narrow and uh, like only handling one thing at a time. Uh, but the number of those is, 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 is an absolute strength of Airflow. Like this is why many people are using Airflow because they, they can do like whatever. Like they, I want to send a message to Slack. There is a Slack operator. Right? You want to do it with like Jira. We have a Jira. Like we have a Jira operator. That's strange, but we do. Uh, uh, and 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 whatever you comes to your mind, I mean, almost uh, you you just look at the operators available, either in community or providers that the other third parties implemented, third party uh, software developers implemented, and and you you got it. That's huge. Strange taking it away is not a good idea. On the other hand, if you are you. Like, we've done a lot of work to make sure that you can mix and match them. So people think, like, consistency is, is, is super important. Either use task flow or use operate, classic operators. You can mix them. It's, it's easy. Mm. And there are cases where you would like to use, uh, to, use, to use operator. And then you can throw in a task flow operator, which does something very specialized or, or 
communicates with two hooks and uh, makes the transfer, put them together, make a dependency, and, and it will, this will still work. That's, that's also the power of Airflow to be able to mix and match those. Yeah, I do agree with you. I think, I mean, I, I, do, I do believe that it's the true power of Airflow. It's, it's at the end of the day, you can pretty much do whatever you want and you have all the flexibility that you want. So if you want to use one operator, then it's fine for you, but you have a bunch of operators that you can use and hopefully they will uh, make your life easier. So yeah, I think exactly right. Airflow strength is that it stays unopinionated. Um, mm. Users can write their own YAML generations for DAG and make it opinionated in their own company. But I think Airflow itself should still remain unopinionated because there are a lot of use cases which I don't even know about. Uh, I have used Airflow in weird ways uh, previously. Uh, so I think Airflow should stay as is. Like you can, you can always prepare your meal by by from scratch or just pick up ready to eat food. It's it's similar. You can write everything in your task flow API from scratch or use uh, um, the operators which are well tested and people want to rely on things that are already tested. Why, why write something that I, I want to add unit tests again um, and if someone else is handling, uh, then it's better. Um, maybe one last, I don't think it's a spicy question, but definitely something that the community is wondering. Um, are we going to get multi-tenancy um, in Airflow? I think it's... I uh, this one is for you, Eric. <laughs> I think it's a question for you. <laughs> no, just maybe one thing. Um, uh, we have uh, currently one of the proposals uh, ongoing um, about the internal uh, API uh, for the RPC and limit the access to the database from some components. So that would be the, like the processor, triggerer, and workers. Um, and this proposal uh, will be one of the requirements for uh, the multi-tenancy. So we are not actively doing the multi-tenancy one, but doing some preparatory work uh, is still good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited for that one. Like uh, the task uh, talking through an API uh, is something that is going in the right direction. Um, so, but yeah, I'll let Jarek talk about the whole project as a whole. Sorry. I don't want to spoil the talk that we are having today with Vincent and, and Mateusz. Uh, so I will not answer your question. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll just tease it a little bit. So uh, for me, uh, Airflow is, and, and that, that refers a little bit back to what Kaxi said just a moment ago, uh, uh, Airflow should be flexible, should be. So I, uh, I'm, I'm very f big fan of thinking of Airflow as a platform. So Airflow as a platform is my uh, theme that I'm repeating quite often. Uh, Airflow is, a, is an application that you can install and use and, and, and do the workflow management, but it's also a platform that opens up various, various possibilities. And for me, multi-tenancy of Airflow should be one of the features of the platform that you can extend it in the way that to make it multi-tenant. This is, the, this is how I think about multi-tenancy right now. It evolved over time because we started this journey of multi-tenancy like one and a half year ago, and we are still uh, doing it. Uh, but for me, it's more like, yes, the answer is yes, but. And the actual answer will be at the like proposal to answer it uh, will be uh, this afternoon. Okay, great. Just a teaser. <laughs> All right. Um, I think um, I mean that that one is that one is um, is a little bit hard because it's about what will Airflow look like in five years. Um, I think it's pretty hard to answer, but maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe it will be uh, all about AI. Maybe. <laughs> what do you think, Airflow? We are going to talk about LLMs specifically <laughs> and generative AI uh, in, our, in our talk tomorrow with Julian. So I'll probably tease somewhat that, yeah, uh, like I was mentioning, that needs to be a balance between innovation and reliability. Uh, so in five years' time, that's too long, but I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Airflow will will be a central part of um ML orchestration as well as, as well as LLM orchestration as well, at least uh, for sure. But I, I'm also curious to uh, hear from both of them. And as, uh, as, uh, from you as well, I want to see what do you want Airflow to be after five years? Well, I, I <laughs> that's a tough one. I think, um, I don't know, I, I like 
I mean, truly, Airflow has evolved so much uh, and improved so much, so much over the past uh, maybe like ten years, I believe, or maybe a little bit less. Um, so I have no idea where the project will be in five years, but what I'm I do know uh, is that uh, the community is still growing uh, and is growing fast. Um, and, and truly, that's why I so far I, I enjoyed that so much, uh, sharing you know all of the good stuff about Airflow. Um, because truly, like we are talking about the faces of Airflow, but I'm I'm not a face. I'm I'm really the messenger of the good things that the community is doing. Uh, that's the truth. Um, and I'm and I think like Airflow will be just uh, bigger and bigger and and hopefully better and will solve a lot of different use cases as uh, it is already doing. Um, so I'm quite excited about the future of Airflow. I don't know where it will be in five years, but I'm sure it will be a bright future for sure. Uh, maybe like. Pierre, if you want to say a few words about the future <coughs> of Airflow. No, no idea. Uh, five years in, is a, in a very long time, as you said. Um, I'm sure we'll be around with a great pro pro project that we'd have uh, evolved. Um, but no idea what would be the features that we're <laughs> going to get in five years. And uh, I should have asked for maybe 30 days or <laughs> something like that. Maybe for one year. We have the question from Ash for one year. Yeah, maybe, maybe one year. One year. Maybe what we, it will be in one year. I guess. Um, for in one year, um, I know that some of the work we're doing is focusing on uh, security. Uh, Dustin uh, talked about that just before. This is something we take very seriously. Uh, it's very important to us. Um, as we know, uh, you might have heard about the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe, um, where the requirements for cyber security will get uh, improved. I think it's very important for us to stay at the bar and above uh, the bar, to be uh, at the state of the art in terms of security. Uh, we already uh, made a group of work where people are helping us um, assess reports, helping us uh, patching uh, security um, uh, reports from uh, researchers. Uh, I think it's, it's been going great so far. And I really thank you all the people that have been involved in, in this group. Um, and uh, that would mean many things. We have some uh, assets that we need to provide for security managers, uh, such as uh, bills of materials uh, or VEX files, uh, so people would be able to assess risks uh, in the blink of an eye uh, by just a lookup against this type of files. Um, we also have some uh, static check uh, to put in place to be able to detect uh, vulnerabilities and bad practices before it goes to production uh, and make Airflow uh, even more secure than it is already. And why not, <clears throat> if we dream, uh, be a standard uh, for the Apache Foundation, like one of the top projects and one of the leading leading the efforts in terms of security and maybe yeah, decline that to all of the other projects. Well, the future looks bright. Um, and maybe the last question is, um, how do I become a contributor? Um, like, how can I contribute uh, to this amazing project if I want to? Um, maybe you can tell us more about that, Eric. Just a few words. I think the the, the most difficult part is just start doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, find a find a place, find a thing that you can contribute a little uh, first, uh, and lead it to completion. And that requires sometimes quite an effort. What you mentioned, Kaxi, like the uh, you add a documentation change and you are asked for unit test. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, it, it does look like a, like even simple contribution takes a little, a lot of time. Uh, it's for a reason, like uh, the stability, uh, the security, the, the backwards compatibility that we that is a feature of Airflow. Like that's that's what how we think about that is important. So that's why uh, sometimes it takes a little bit more time just contributing la one line code takes uh, sometimes a week. Mm -hmm. So in order to become a contributor, you really have to f be like start with this uh, thinking that, okay, uh, I want to do a very good contribution. It will take a little bit of time, a little bit of iterations, but once you get it and you have your first PR merged, it becomes easier and easier because you learn how to do it. So just starting. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, and I think with uh, now is a good time to start because uh, with Breeze, uh, everything gets much easier. Uh, uh, as Jarek mentioned, uh, maybe pick something small at the beginning, uh, create your own uh, small expertise on some area of the code, 
and then you can start uh, reviewing P PR, uh, take more issues and bigger things. Uh, maybe providers as well are a good way to start because the code is, uh, the scope is well defined and the change is uh, limited, uh, I would say, in the code base. So this is also a good way to start and uh, good, first good first issues, uh, of course. Um, yeah, I think that would be. So we can, we can see that there are many ways of, to contribute to, the, to this project. And as you said earlier, Yarek, uh, actually small features matter a lot. Um, so we don't have to start with a very big feature. We can just start small and contribute, uh, which is awesome. Okay, thank you so much uh, for, for everything. I think it's time for uh, questions. So maybe if you have any uh, questions, you can just raise your hand and ask to the panel. Any questions you have? Yes, over there, if we can give a mic. Just here. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna... Thank you. Thank you. So now that you mentioned that you have grown on how to go with the project, um, I felt surprised when, you know, uh, smart sensors were introduced and then almost deprecated right away. So I would like to know what happened and if we can expect some features to come and then you say like, oh, no, we're gonna change that. So how comfortable are you gonna be with releasing new features and then make them stable? Your question is how can, how can we make um, features, how can we propose features and make sure we deliver well, that or? Not so much, you release a smart sensor, so you know, we start introducing them and then you will say like, oh, that's deprecated almost right away. So it's more like how comfortable are we like you release a, a, really a feature that's gonna stay. Yeah, so I think there, there are some features or when, when we're building uh, certain features, we are not so sure about it and we mark those as experimental. And I think right. we should definitely check the docs when, when we do that, like smart sensors was mm -hmm. one where we were not so sure about the design, but uh, it also sounded like a problem worth solving and differable operators solve it in a much better way. That's why right. I think, I'm glad that we didn't mark that as generally available directly. Experimental was the right term, and there are still a couple of features that are experimental around um, handling callbacks and stuff. Uh, so yeah, just just look for the warning uh, warning sign. Okay. Um, but providing earlier feedback is also uh, helpful. Like uh, the, there's a three day voting period uh, when we create release candidates, and if if you use it and say okay, this does not look good, I think uh, the earlier we we hear your opinions, I think it's better. Yeah, just, better. just to add to it, I think uh, uh, we've learned from smart sensors that it was too fast and too, uh, too, too hasty, let's say. And if you see the la latest experimental thing we released, which is like caching of variables in the last release, it took really a lot of discussion and time to make it. Even now in experimental phase, and I don't think it's likely that it will go go away because, like, we considered and and like discussed it. Um, uh, like two releases passed until we decided, okay, let's get it in. Because we think, yeah, maybe it's still experimental, let's see how it works, but it looks like it's gonna be staying forever, yeah? Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> I was just hoping to get an opinion on um, when you recommend using um, batch scheduling technologies as opposed to airflow, um, just because at my company, uh, users use it for more batch cases and they tend to create many, many, many thousands of tasks in a, at a time. And I find that airflow doesn't perform very well and it can take hundreds of hours to get it to perform well. Um, so I was just wondering how you guys think about batch use cases and whether you think batch, there's use cases where the batch schedulers are a better choice than Airflow. So we do a lot of performance benchmarking um, as part of Astronomer as well as open source. Uh, and when we released uh, Scheduler HA and did all the performance optimization, we probably scaled it up to a good chunk of tasks. So I think Airflow should scale up well. Like it depends on what resources you provide to the scheduler. Like it won't work if you provide one CPU and uh, Few few hundred megs, so it should perform 
perform according to the resources you provide. Like there is no technical limitations uh, that that would hamper hamper the scale, at least from the scheduler scheduling perspective. Web server is a different story because uh, there's so much you can uh, handle uh, from from the UI, but scheduling and and the worker execution uh, it should just scale appropriately. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for all of your um, answers. That was, I think, very interesting. Um, and we can. <laughs>